Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH. I'm up in Calgary, in Alberta, Canada, at Cool IT Systems, and today we're gonna to do something that I don't think a lot of people have seen before. Specifically, we're actually gonna go look at this server over here, which is the Gigabyte H262ZL0, which is a liquid-cooled 2U, four-node, eight CPU, so we have AMD Epic Milan CPUs in here, but it's cooled by liquid, and it's cooled by this CDU over here, and I'm gonna show you not just this server, but I'm gonna show you how this entire loop works, and what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna go run this and show you how to build, all the way from just components, build up a system that can actually cool very hot CPUs all using liquid cooling. Hey guys, it's Future Me. I just wanna note real quick, and I wanna say thank you to the Gigabyte and Cool IT folks. This required like four months of coordination to get all this done. They also sponsored me going up to Calgary and actually being able to show you this, and this is gonna be absolutely wild what you're about to see. In fact, we were able to cool what basically would be over 20,000 AMD Epic 7003 Milan server cores in these Gigabyte servers using more or less the flow from a garden hose with what we had set up. I mean, that's just absolutely wild. And the other thing is that we're actually doing this in the Cool IT Liquid Lab. And it was really cool. So we actually stayed an extra day and did an entire video on that, which we'll post in probably a couple of weeks. So you can go and definitely hit that subscribe button and check out whenever we go post that video. But what it practically means is that we are doing this in a live lab environment. So there are machines doing things like stress testing behind me. And so there is gonna be a little bit of background noise. It's a lab, that's what it is. There are also gonna be people walking in and out because well, they have to do their day jobs and they have things to go do. And there are bins of parts behind me and stuff like that that people have to go pick from. But overall, this is gonna be super cool, and I think you're gonna to totally understand liquid cooling and servers after we get through this video. With that, future me out. So with that, let's get to the hardware. So part of the magic of this entire Gigabyte H262 ZL0 is really, I guess, the server itself. And it's really this liquid cooling, but frankly, we don't really get to see a lot of like, how do these liquid cooling solutions get put together? And so that's exactly why what we're gonna start with today is the bare server. And I'm actually going to build up this liquid cooling loop and we're gonna go through how this whole thing works. And so let's get started really with the server node. And in the H262ZL0, there are a total of four nodes. Each node is hot swappable and it comes on these little sleds. And so you'll see that we actually have the MZ62 HD4 motherboard, which is common, I guess, between this and also some of the other models. So it is a common platform, but there's special firmware on here to take advantage and to take into account the fact that this actually is a liquid cooled server versus their air cooled variants. Now you might see online that we have the H262ZL0, but there's also an H262ZL1. You may be wondering, well, what's the difference between the ZL1 and the ZL0? And that's really just comes down to how much is being cooled by liquid cooling here. So we have our passive cold loop over here, which is the PCL. And you're gonna see this over here. And that, this only really cools the two CPUs because those are by far the hottest components in the server. On the ZL1, not only do we go and cool the CPUs, but we also cool the memory and also a Mellanox or NVIDIA ConnectX 6 NIC. So you have everything basically cooled and you really don't need that much airflow or any airflow through the chassis because you're basically cooling all of the components using liquid cooling. But that was a lot harder to set up, so we're just gonna do the ZL0 version and we're gonna cool the dual AMD Epic CPUs. Now for this, we're actually gonna use the AMD Epic Milan series, and we've done uh, three of these nodes already, so I have practiced a little bit, but this particular node, we're gonna put 7713, so 64 core AMD Epic 7003, which is the Milan series. We're actually gonna go put those into this, and let's kind of get to that. Let's just start building this thing out. All right, so first step, we gotta go install our CPUs. So to do that, you know, of course we do the normal thing with our AMD Epic CPUs, where you have to go pull out both the, of the socket protectors. And we're just gonna do that real quick. And this is not the perfect way to go do this, but we are doing this in a lab and we're doing this with a little bit of time constraint. So we're gonna do this kind of quickly. And as a quick note, if you didn't know this, the AMD Ryzen Threadripper torque wrench is the exact same spec, because it's SP3, as the Epic one. So you can actually use the Threadripper one, it's a little bit smaller than the Epic one. Okay, so let's do a little change real quick, and I'm just gonna show you what this basically looks like in terms of the PCL. So basically what we have is we have the cold plates, and you're gonna see that there is one of these, which is blue. The blue is actually going to be the tube, which is our cool water that'll go in. It'll go through CPU two, one, and then out. 
and then this would be the hot side, so we're gonna have red on here. We're gonna show you why these colors are important in a quick second, but let's get this installed first. Now, on the bottom of this, of course, you're gonna see that we actually have, and I'm trying not to mess up the, the thermal interface material here, but you can see that we have the TIM for the AMD Epic CPUs, as well as actually some of the VRMs. Also, we have cooling for that as well. And so that's basically the big components that this is trying to cool. Now that the CPUs are installed, the next step is, well, kind of clearly we have to go deal with all of the tubing. And so what you're gonna see here is the fact that now that we have these installed, we have tubing, but the tubing really will not fit into the chassis because well, you kind of see that we have this little IO plate here. And basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace a riser slot with this IO plate. Okay, so we're gonna undo that. And then basically we'll see that the riser slot actually comes out. And you can see that this actually doesn't have a PCB on the riser because you're not gonna use this for an expansion card. Instead, you're really gonna use this for liquid cooling. So I'm not sure of the best way to actually do this, but what I've been doing is I've been taking this out and then I actually thread the tubes through, line up the IO plates, and then reinstall the IO plate on the bracket, and we're good. Now that we have the IO plate installed on the riser, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go and just make sure that we have it at the right depth, which we do almost done perfectly on the first shot. All right, and now what I'm gonna do is we're gonna cut away for a second. I'm just gonna go and put these screws back in because you don't wanna watch that. Okay, so now the next step is that we're gonna go install RAM in here. And so we're gonna install a total of 16, 64 gigabyte DDR4 DIMMs in here, just because that's what I brought. So now we have a total of one terabyte of memory installed on this. We have two 64 core CPUs, so we have 128 cores, 256 threads, and one terabyte of memory. And this is liquid cooled now. So I think it is time to definitely look at what this entire solution has per node. Okay, so over here we have the connectors and this actually is for power, has things like our PCIe connections for our PCIe SSDs that are up front. And then behind that we have our CPU and this is the second CPU in the cooling loop and that CPU has eight DIMMs, so we have full eight channel memory on this as well. Next we have the other CPU, which this is the first CPU in the cooling loop. And so this has another eight channel memory, so we have eight DIMMs installed here. And then getting to the back of the server, we actually see some things that are a little bit different. And specifically here, what we're gonna see is we have an M.2 internal slot. And this is really, if you want like a boot device or something like that, you put that here. Now you only have one, so you could say, well, it's not redundant. But on the other hand, I think that with this kind of model where you can just kind of pull out a sled and it's very easy to go and pull out a sled. A lot of times people just say, well, it's pretty easy to service anyway. And if your boot SSD dies, you're probably gonna reboot the node anyway. So this is kind of like one of those things that is just kind of how these systems are built. Now here, what we actually have is we still, even though we have all this other stuff going on, we also have a low profile PCIe Gen 4 by 16 slot. So you could put another accelerator or you could put something like another NIC or something like that here. But that's not the only slot that we have available for our NICs because on the bottom, you can see that we actually have an OCP NIC 3.0 slot. And so we can certainly have a NIC and that would probably be where your primary NICs would go in this. And you can see again that, that second riser slot, instead of there being a riser, we actually have the tubes for the liquid cooling. And hey, while we're at it, let's just kind of take a look real quick. We have a management NIC for our IPMI out-of-band management. We also have two one gigabit ethernet ports, which is really just kind of for like your, like management in your OS interfaces. And then what we also have is we have two USB 3 ports as well as a display port. So if you do have a KVM car, you'd use a display port. And you're gonna notice that this is not a full-size display port because, well, there's not enough room for a full-size display on the back of the system. Now, the overall H.262, of course, uses four of these nodes, and I'm gonna have to go grab the other ones because they're over there in a sec, but we're just gonna kind of call out a couple points on the back of the system. First, because we have four nodes and each one of these nodes can take, you know, up to say 240, 280 watt TDP CPUs, that practically means that we can easily go over two kilowatts in the system because we have four CPUs that can each use over uh, 250 watts. And so because of that, we actually have two 2.2 kilowatt 80 plus platinum rated power supplies, so these are higher efficiency power supplies, and that's why we have them. And that basically goes in here. And then just like that is actually how we go when we start putting in the nodes. When you want to service a node, or if you just want to install a node, you're basically going to put it in here, and then the latch will engage, it'll be in place, and now it's snug in its place. This is the last node, and we're just going to go install this, and I'm going to kind of show you what this looks like. And actually this is a new latching system from Gigabyte. This is different than what they use say in like 2017 or 2018 or something like that. And it's a lot nicer 
uh, than the older versions. It actually feels really pretty solid when you go put it in. And now we can kind of see though, as you can see how the system is set up. And I just want to talk through this before we kind of change views. One of the things that you're going to want to see here is the fact that we have, um, we actually have the two nodes that are side by side and there's a two stacks, so there's a node under this. And then the other thing that you're going to see is that we still have fans in the system. And the reason that we have fans is because this is not the ZL1 version where we have cooling for the memory and also cooling for that ConnectX 6 NIC. Instead, this is the ZL0 version, so we still need that airflow. And we need that airflow specifically to make sure that we are cooling the RAM as well as the NICs. And the other reason that we have fans is frankly just because of storage. So this system has the ability to put up to six two and a half inch NVMe SSDs on the front of the system. And what that practically means is that each SSD can use several watts. You know, we've often seen like, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 watts per SSD, sometimes more. But you basically have to be able to cool all of those. And, you know, you have a total of 24 of them on the front of the chassis. So that's why you may still need fans in either case. Now, that's why we still have fans here. But remember, because we're not cooling the, you know, main two kilowatts of power that's going through this, what that practically means is that these fans can run at much lower speeds. By running at lower speeds, they can use less power. And we actually did a piece on this looking at, you know, what the power consumption is of fans in a system. And on a lot of like high density systems, you can see power consumption of fans and cooling just over 20% easily these days. And so that's why this liquid cooling can tend to be a very big power and cost savings in a system. And just to note real quick, guys, you can actually go and these hot swap bays are super nice because what you can do is we have Kyokushia SSDs here, and these are 3.84 terabyte SSDs that we're using. And you can basically see that these things are completely toolless. So you don't necessarily need to go and have like four screws and put them in this tray. These things just pop into place. So you just go snap and it's in. And then you just hot swap these things. Super easy to go do. And that is just a nice feature of this newer generation system. And on the back of the system, you can see that next to the power supplies, what we actually have is a little tiny NIC port. And what that is specifically there for is it is a feature called the Chassis Management Controller or CMC. And that kind of sits right up here. It's another HP BMC. And what that in theory allows you to do is monitor not just the shared fans and all that kind of stuff, but also potentially get into the BMCs of each additional node. Okay, so now that we have these eight nodes installed, I think that that's only part of the solution though, right? Because the H262 ZL0 really needs liquid cooling from the facility or the rack or whatever. And so my thought was, well, why don't we get to that and actually kind of look at the system? And so instead of just kind of running the system in a rack, what I thought we would do is set up an entire cooling setup on this bench here. And because we're in the lab, we can actually go show you what this entire loop looks like. Now, you just saw me put together this server. And what I want to do now is explain how the server works in conjunction with the rest of the rack infrastructure. And so to do that, the best way I thought was like, well, what if we could actually just show it? And so what we managed to do with the wonderful Cool IT Systems Liquid Cooling Lab is we're actually able to go and make this set up on the desktop or the test bench top, where we actually have the server, we have the CDU, and we have the rack manifold. So these are the main components that you would need to go and set up a liquid cooling rack. And this is exactly what we're gonna go walk through. And I'm gonna show you exactly how everything works. And I think a lot of folks understand the idea of air cooling, right? You have a heat sink, you have a heat source, and you basically just push air over it. And that's how that works. So you'd have air that goes from the front of the chassis to the back, and you just blast fans. But liquid cooling is a little bit different. And a lot of people call it things like water cooling and all that kind of stuff that's not exactly accurate. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through how the heat exchange happens using the CDU and rack manifold. And we're going to kind of walk through that process so you can go tell your friends and colleagues how really high-end liquid cooling works. So let's talk about where the water is in the system. So down here, you actually are gonna see the water inlet pipe. And how, what basically happens is that we do have a water source that we're gonna turn on in a little bit, but that basically brings cool water that comes from the facility and goes into the CDU. So this CDU that we're looking at, and CDU, by the way, is cooling distribution unit that we're looking at is the Cool IT Systems CHX80. That means that this is designed to cool up to 80 kilowatts of power, which is basically like up to like 40 or so of those systems. And just to be clear, this is a little bit of an older unit that we're using for this experiment. So new versions of the CHX80 actually are, are a little bit different than this, but we're able to show this one because we're in the lab and, uh, you know, we might break it. So this is the one that we get to use. Now, following the cool liquid into this and the cool water that's coming from the facility into this, you're gonna see this like insulated, this just giant insulated cavity right here. 
And what this device is really designed to do is this is a heat exchanger. So the water will come in from the facility. It will go into this heat exchanger. It will take heat that is being produced in the server and through that loop. And then it will actually take that heat, exchange it to the liquid, and then it will be expelled out of the CDU. So when people talk about water cooling, really the water is specifically coming into the CDU. It's usually treated when it's, it's for things like corrosion and contamination and all that kind of stuff when it's in a data center. But that's basically what's coming into the CDU and being expelled out with the heat. But the liquid loop that's actually cooling the server, well, that has to have a whole bunch of different things in it. Like, for example, the liquid cooling loop will have to have things like things for anti-corrosion and antibacterial. And the other thing it has to do is make sure that it doesn't freeze. So something that I just didn't know before I started doing this is that, you know, these systems will go and they'll go through cold environments. We're in Canada and it's definitely it was minus 16 last night, so it's definitely below freezing. But also you have to think these things will actually get air shipped. And so you'll have, you know, if they're being shipped air freight, they get really cold. And so you don't want necessarily the liquid to expand and then crack seals and things like that when and freeze when you're you know air shipping these things so you're actually using a different set of additives and different set of liquid in your main cooling loop than you are in the external uh, loop so this up here is the reservoir and the main purpose of the reservoir is to ensure that there's always fluid in the system and that liquid is able to go and keep fluid primed into the pumps because there are three pumps in the system that makes them redundant and the basic idea is that you never want to run them dry because they could potentially break if they're run dry for a period of time. Below the reservoir, what you're actually going to see is that we have a total of three large pumps. And these are basically moving all the fluid through the system. And then down uh, in front of that, we actually have the control units. Because something you have to understand is that this is not just a dumb pump system. These things are, you can see all the wires that are going through this. And what they're doing is they're actually looking at things like water flow rates. They're looking at temperatures. And so they have a whole bunch of different sensors. Like they have to maintain, you know, sensors on the pumps to make sure that they're still spinning. And so these things are all being run and being monitored centrally. So you can actually go do that at a data center scale. And that's really what this does. Over here, what we have is a three-way valve, and that's what allows you to do things like pressure regulation. So, you know, depending on your load, you may have to have different amounts of pressure and amount of fluid going through the system at a different rate. And so that's what kind of helps with that. And what all of these pumps, sensors, reservoirs, three-way valves, all of this is there for is really for that heat exchange and moving the liquid to these servers. And how that actually happens is we have the cool supply on this side, and then we also have the hot side. So after it goes through the servers and is heated up, that comes back right over here. So this cool liquid supply will go to the rack manifold, but you'll basically see that we have both the blue and we'll also have a red side. And in this, it's actually pretty easy. Blue means cool and red means hot. So after the heat has been exchanged, we go to the cool supply on the CDU, which goes into our rack manifold on the cool side, which is these blue nozzles. And then you'll see that these hoses go back into the individual server nodes. So what you'll see is that the cool supply goes into the block on this side, and then it goes through that block. It then goes through this little tube right here to the second liquid block, also called the PCL or passive cooling loop. And then once it's gone through these, it's now the liquid is hot again and it is expelled, it then ends up at the rack manifold on the red side. And then from the rack manifold, it goes back into the CDU. And then that hot liquid ends up back at our heat exchanger. And that's the point that the heat gets dumped into basically the facility water. And that's basically how the heat is expelled from the CPUs all the way out to the CDU and then out to the facility. And the next step is we're actually going to go wire this all with power and networking. And what we're going to do is turn it on, even on side, and we're hopefully going to get this to go and work. And if we did, assuming we did, is you're going to actually see the fact that we got some decent performance out of this. And we're going to talk about the performance of how this performed versus kind of how our Control 2U4 node AMD Epic platforms with the same CPUs perform. And so we're going to have that in charts here. And you might be wondering why I'm recording from a bathroom right now, but this is actually the water source that we're just temporarily using just for a few minutes to go and run this while running a couple benchmarks. And what you can see is that we actually have liquid and water coming in on, a, I think it's like a three quarter inch pipe. And that's basically giving us, you can see the hose here, 
whoa, about 30 liters per minute of flow. And this is basically a garden hose amount of water cooling two racks of 2U four node servers. And each one of those has about 512 cores. That is absolutely wild. Hey guys, it's Future Me again. I just really wanna note the importance of what we're showing here. We were actually gonna cut this whole bathroom thing and we kind of filmed it and we're like, well, are we gonna use it? But the importance of this is, as you can see that little hose that's kind of going, right? That is using something like 30 liters per minute. So if you just kind of had a hose and you just kind of let it go, you're pushing about 30 liters per minute. And when we did the math after we finished filming, we basically figured out that that is actually enough flow rate through the heat exchanger to be able to cool 80 kilowatts using that CDU that we had on the test bench. And what that practically means is that we have about, tw about two kilowatts or so of AMD Epic processors that are in the Gigabyte H262 ZL0 that's also there. And so if you can cool a total of 64 cores per socket, two sockets per server that gives you in four nodes, a total of 512 cores at you know two kilowatts, if you scale that up to the 80 kilowatts and you just multiply by 40, you get basically the fact that we can cool over 20,000 cores worth of AMD Epic 7003 Milan CPU cores using that 4U heat exchanger and basically the flow of water from the tap. Now, of course, that is not a permanent solution. It's just something that we use to just kind of test like, hey, if what, what can we use that's relatable to just someone at home that just kind of understands, you know, hey, this is what's coming out of my garden hose in terms of water. That's why liquid cooling is way more efficient than, or at least way less costly than using electricity. Now, of course, that would assume that you're just disposing of the water after you've put heat into it, but realistically, you would put it into a secondary process that would just chill it down, and then you would recycle that water, just so that way you're just not wasting water. But at the same time, that is just an absolutely mind-numbingly small number to be able to cool that many cores, and that's why we left this in this video. I hope you think that's really interesting, because I was like, whoa, that is crazy when we saw it. With that, Let's get back to it. Okay, so we actually have the CPU running with all the pumps running at 100%. And in the lab, you basically can't even hear it. It sounds like a, I don't know, a small aquarium pump or something like that is definitely nowhere near what you hear when you're behind two four node servers in a rack. I mean, those things are like jet engines and this is super quiet. In fact, what I'm gonna do is hopefully get this mic really close to this, just so you can hear like how quiet this is. It's absolutely mind boggling. Okay, here we go. We're gonna move with this over here and hopefully you guys can hear this, uh, but it is super quiet. This right here is actually running. All four nodes are powered on and everything. And the fans, because they're really only cooling the memory and the drives up front, even though we don't have this panel, which means that the fans are running more than they normally would. I mean, you can barely hear it. You can hear me speak, which you could not do on an air-cooled unit. Again, let's go get this, uh, let's go get this mic. We're gonna go over here, you can kind of hear it, but this is super quiet. You would not be able to hear me speak next to a 2U four node server if it was completely air cooled. This is wild. Two benefits from liquid cooling really are the fact that we're able to run at turbo frequencies for longer periods of time, especially when you're running high performance computing workloads, when you get chips to be very hot, what you'll see is that you get heat soak. And when you get that heat soak, you'll see that on air-cooled systems, sometimes the clock speeds will actually dip. And when those clock speeds dip, you get less performance. So that is why liquid cooling is better for sustained high performance and high power workloads. The other thing though, in the really big one is also just the fact that this uses so much less power than running fans to cool the entire system. The fact that you're using this heat exchange loop, you're able to cool a lot more efficiently than just trying to blast more and more air over a heat sink. And so that is really, I think, one of the biggest reasons that folks are really looking at liquid cooling in future generations of servers. Future generations of servers are gonna use a lot more power in terms of CPUs and GPUs. We're already starting to see that, or we started to see that really in 2021, but especially as we go later into 2022 and we see the next generation of hardware and then future generations, you're definitely gonna see the power consumption is gonna go up. And basically, if you do wanna have the highest performance accelerators, you wanna have the highest performance CPUs, what you are going to need is some sort of liquid cooling solution if you wanna have any kind of density at all. So my hope is that this video helped you understand how data center liquid cooling works. We kind of walked through an entire loop. We got to see a liquid cooled server in this Gigabyte H262 ZL0. We got to see that all being set up and how one maybe is a little bit different from a traditional air cooled 2U4 node server. 
But the key thing, if you walk away from this learning anything, is really just the fact that you do need to go, if you do have servers, you do need to start thinking about liquid cooling now because the day of you're going to need liquid cooling in your data center if you want to have the highest performance parts, I mean, that's coming and that's very soon. And hey, if you did like this, we're also gonna to tour this liquid cooling lab. So you definitely wanna go stay tuned for that. And if you did like this video, well, why don't you give this video a like, click subscribe, turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.